here and now, here we are, we're all here, and here we go. So, Ahmad, how bad is it? How good is it? Well, you know, let's put it this way. When it comes to uh, fighting man to man, uh, the resistance are uh, they are doing very well in southern Lebanon and in, in Gaza. Um, they are giving the Zionists a really hard time in both areas. But in southern Lebanon, the Zionists they have been trying to um, um, go into Lebanon, occupy like southern Lebanon. They couldn't uh, pass uh, more than like at maximum depth. They managed about uh, uh, one and a half kilometers, about a mile, then retreat back. Mm -hmm. This is about 50,000 soldiers they have <laughs> deployed. Same thing in, in Gaza. Uh, the resistance, uh, you know, giving the heart to the Zionists. Um, every day they're blowing tanks, uh, APCs, uh, bulldozers, uh, sniping soldiers. However, on the other hand, the Zionists are doing very well in their genocide by uh, encircling hundreds of thousands of Palestinians in northern Gaza, uh, you know, cutting off them from water, food, medicine, emergencies, etc. So uh, same thing they're doing in Lebanon. So there's two wars. So there's a war that the, the resistance is doing is, is, in a way, defeating the Zionists. Whereas the Zionists, in turn, they go and vent their terrorism on women, children, elderly, and unarmed civilians. It, you know, uh, destroying uh, homes, hospitals, uh, schools, uh, even uh, in the city of Balba in, in northern Lebanon. They attacked uh, thousands of years, uh, you know, uh, uh, Roman uh, artifacts and, and um, ruins. So they did that in Gaza, where they decimated the old city of Gaza, which is about at least 2,000, 3,000 years old. They destroyed the whole thing. Mm. So this is um, the war that the Zionists are carrying. They think by doing so, they will uh, bring the, the resistance to heal and accept defeat and wave the white flag. And that doesn't, it's not going to happen. No way. Mm -hmm. yeah. no, not going to happen, no. The, uh, how big of an impact is this all going to have on the American elections, Steve? Well, that remains to be seen. <laughs> there is a um, movement of people from the Levant, the Middle East, whose ancestors, who, whose um, children and grandchildren live in the United States. They live here. And they are part of a movement that um, is opposed to the Harris uh, Biden presidency. Um, they're not voting for Trump. They said they're not going to vote for Harris. We'll just see. We'll have to just see. We really don't know. I, the, I can say that in the campaigns, me, I don't see it as an issue with what the, what the politicians say. But when it comes to voters, people are concerned. More and more people are concerned about what's happening uh, in Gaza and Lebanon. Time will tell how they respond when it comes to elections. I, I, I don't know. The, the polls may say one thing, but it depends on who, who is polling and who is polled. You know, uh, this is such an unusual, extraordinary situation because they're evenly... Uh, polls now. There, there's sort of, you know, no advantage to one candidate or the other. Now, that means that the matter of uh, Gaza and Palestine could be the deciding issue in the election. This is the historic deciding issue in the election. Because I would terms... say it's a, it's a deciding, it, it's a factor, but it's not a decisive, a decisive issue. More important than abortion. Now it's considered. It, it is. It is no, it's still abortion is still a, a big issue in, in the in, you know the, is it, the, the American election. Mm -hmm. um, to me, there's no difference between neither uh, candidate. Uh, like a vote to to uh, Harris is a vote vote for that terrorist called uh, Benny Gantz. 
and a vote to Trump is vote for Smotrich. So basically, you you <laughs> so there's no uh, no voting there. So the only option left for uh, anti-war people is to vote for the third candidates, uh, like Jill Stein, for example. She is the Green candidate. So there's a momentum for her. Of course, she's not going to win because you know how how the elections are rigged in the United States. You have to vote one or the other. That one of the two capitalist, uh, you know, system, either the Republican or the, you know, the uh, Democrats. So basically, um, it, it is a factor in a way, but I wouldn't say it's the decisive factor. There's other factors. Uh, it, it depends who you ask. But um, I, I'm sorry to say that, but a minority of people in the United States will be voting on the issue of Palestine or the Zionist uh, genocide in Palestine and now in Lebanon. Yes, a minority would be concerned more so with Palestine than other yes. issues that are local. Yes, yes for sure. Yes. But those local issue people, they're evenly divided. Okay, so 2% of the population are Muslim and Arabs, perhaps mm -hmm. more than 2% if you say Muslim. Yes, and it's about 5%, I would say. Yeah, and that 2%, you know, like, is a deciding factor because not that they're going to be voting for Jill Stein or Cornell West. Yeah. I don't expect that they'll know about them even, you know, because they haven't yeah. been able to be provided, you know, with that information yet. Exactly. But if they don't vote for the Democrats, they just have to abstain from voting. And all of a sudden, in the Electoral College, which is to the advantage of Trump, all of a sudden, that's a deciding factor in the election and Trump wins and Harris loses. That's what I foresee. Oh, definitely, definitely. If I am an American, I would vote for uh, Kanye West or Jill Stein for sure, and I will never vote for either party. That's for sure. Would it no, be? No. Uh, would their names be on the international ballots for Americans? I wonder if they got onto that ballot. I think they are. They should be on the ballot. Uh, if they are. If they're registered. But it's that's not national. You know, they have to that's register with every question. state. Yeah. And Jill yeah, Stein is only registered in about uh, 25 states, I understand. Yeah, that's a good question. If how that is handled as far as the non the non-democratic and non-republican presidential candidates, that's a very good question to find out. I could I think we can find out. I, I, I don't think it'd be that hard to find out. I'll make a phone call do or just do a little, little a little internet search because to be quote unquote fair, which of course the, the American system is not fair. No, you would have to put all the candidates that are available in any state to run. But you know, I, I, that's a good question because the the elections are handled by the State Department through uh, the U.S. embassies, as I understand it. You have to go there or notify them. Or they do an email, or say, you know, I'm not sure how how it works. It's a good, good, very good question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Where you at, uh, Steve? Did they put the third party candidate in in uh, last election? Yes, the current. The, I um I did my in person voting yesterday, and Jill Stein was on the can was on the elect was on the ballot as oh. was the Party for Socialism and Liberation, as was the Libertarian Party, mm -hmm. as was Robert F Kennedy Jr. So all the candidates, um, the Democrat, Republicans, and the four. Or five non-major candidate party candidates were on were on the ballot. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, but not, we'll see. It'll not be Cornell West. To watch. Just a just a, a one point here. Not C C Cornell West. He wasn't on the ballot in California. Um, I don't remember seeing him. No. Wow. I mean, but that's that's now that's my memory. It yeah. could be wrong. Probably but right. I, yeah. I don't. I don't remember seeing. I saw Libertarian Jill Jill Stein, uh, Party for Socialism and Liberation. Um, the Republican Democrat. Then there, there could have been a space for write-in. I'm yeah. not sure. Okay. Yes, Ahmed. It, I, I said it, it will be a very interesting uh, show to to watch <laughs> on Tuesday. Night. It's a show. It's not. It's not a real thing. It's just. It's right. a make-believe. You know, uh, voting uh, make-believe democracy. You know, there's no right. thing called democracy. You cannot. Be a democracy and spend the billions of dollars to sway voters to vote for you. That's not democracy. <laughs> that's called <laughs> that's called uh, uh, you know uh, marketplace. You know marketing. Anyway, 
basically, yeah, it will be interesting to see and watch. Um, I, I, you know, I, I, if anybody, if I, as I said, if I am, I'm an American, I will, I will vote for the third party candidate for sure, either Kenny West or uh, Cornell West or uh, Jill mm -hmm. Stein. Mm -hmm. this, this, this somebody, somebody I do want to, I do, I do want to make a, a share my opinion about something. I've been kind of, I, I kept my mouth shut for a few months now, but now elections coming up, I want to say something. What concerns me is how many people overseas, people who are not, even who are not in Canada or Mexico. I think the Canadian, Canadians and Mexicans have a better sense of what's going on in the United States. I do because because they're closer in proximity. But the further away you are, the more of an expert you become on American elections. I find it to be fascinating. Everybody say Trump is going to win. Well, how do you say that? And they have no basis on how they what this. That Trump's got to win. Trump's going to be the next president. I don't. I mean, I unfortunately live here. I don't know who's going to be president. To me, it's it's crazy. If, if everything runs away, I think it's going to be it's going to be a very tight race. Then we'll see. We'll see. But I really it have been interesting to see how many people around the world say Trump's going to win. I just I've I've been amazed myself. Mm. Yeah, that's all. That's it's wishful thinking more than it's uh, based on true facts. It just yeah. only it just comes out of the mind and say, okay, I think Trump will win, but that's it. You know, that's that's baloney. Yeah. I agree with you. Yeah, but I, I think that he does have a, a constitutional advantage because of the electoral college because that gives more weight to the central and western states that represent more the German-American population, which are 25% of the population. And guess what? Yeah. Trump is German-American. Yeah, but not necessarily that because they're, they are a German uh, background, they will vote for him. There's lots of people, they have different ideas, and lots of them be mm -hmm. Democrats or even on the left side. Doesn't Indeed. have to be that 25% will vote for Trump. Not yeah, necessarily. Yeah, that's not necessarily, but yeah. I'm very fearful of German political political thought, <laughs> to say the least. On, on, on the other hand, living here, I've never heard of that in my entire life. No, it's not known, yeah. But the German I mean, Americans never, are 25% of the population. Anglo-Americans are 26% of the population. Um, Black Americans, I think, are 17%. Uh, 11, 17, 17, registered citizens who are Spanish Americans are eleven percent. I heard That's, fifteen. Yeah. Well, including you know the uh, unregistered you know workers, yes. Yeah. For sure. But yeah. they don't have a vote. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. There's yeah. a yeah. Prison. Yeah, the white white vote is about sixty percent of the American uh, you know uh, population. That's for sure. But that right. can if be. If you consider the Spanish Americans to be white. No, 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 no. Even with the Spanish Americans, it depends on the color. <laughs> if you are Latin American, you are not, you're not white, you are Hispanic. Yes, but, but if you if come 26... from Spain, if you yes. come from Spain and white, oh, yes, that's another matter. Yeah, but there you okay. are. If your your birth certificate says that you were born in Portugal, Portugal or. In Spain, then you automatically you are a white because you come from Europe. But if you yeah. come from Mexico City and you still fair, you are yeah. considered as Hispanic. Yeah, even if you have the same name. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Arabs, yeah. Arabs, we are con we are considered as white. Arab ah. Americans. Oh, we're whites. Okay. Uh, yeah. Well, now yeah, many, 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 people don't, many people don't understand how the United States does it, does its its um. Ethnic versus racial classifications. It's very interesting. Yeah. Because yeah. uh Agbenes is exactly right. The, the the Hispanics have the, the, the term Hispanic has been used in a very a very clever way to create an ethnicity that um it yeah, is on if say you say you're if they ask you, are you Latino? Yes. And then I say, Oh. Is it is yeah, it's, it's it's very interesting. It's very yes. curious how they all develop. Oh, it, it, it has it has some racist uh, yes. uh, yes. low tone to it. It's like yes, it does. It African does. It American. Af Africa is not one country, is not one ethnicity, is not one culture. Africa is diverse as 
as Asia is diverse. So when you say African American, that means all African American are one people, one background, one culture. That's and that's true. not true. But and that's true. They're blacks. That's it. Yeah. Yeah, Same black thing is, as is the, Latin. the best word to use is blacks. That's the consider the situation. That's the best word. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah, that's is, that's yeah. yeah that's a, that's the American system. That's the the uh, post uh, post uh, slavery system, which becoming right. more uh, uh, in disguise, more than yeah. it used to be as 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 vicious as it was. Now it's more in disguise, as you know, putting yes. people in categories. But still, it's yes. very racist way. Yes, it's sure, a very definitely. incoherent, you know, irrational uh, sort of criterion as well, yes. you know, because yes. there used to be this thing called the one sixteenth, or the one drop rule. One drop uh, rule, right? The one drop rule, you know, like if you if you had, you know, like in many cases, you know, the same sort of insanity, because if you have, you know, like an an ancestor who was. Um, bl black African American, then you were, even though you looked white. Uh, also, you know, Jewish uh, Americans were not considered to be white in the 50s, but now we're considered to be white, like yeah, uh, Arabs are now considered to be white because the whites are running out of people, you know, the 26 <laughs> and the 25 percent, you know, are only a barely, you know, like 51 percent. They're losing con control of the country and they're looking for allies. And so, you know, they consider other people to be white, even though they don't really consider other people to be white, you know. Yeah, <laughs> Arab people. You could put us in one category. We are Arabs because we speak same language, we have same culture. Exactly. But but uh, uh, genetically, we are diverse. Yeah, we right. have black Arabs. We have uh, white Arabs. We have brown Arabs. We have yellow Arabs. We all we all who come from all shades of light, uh, uh, colors. Yeah, right. fifty shades of beige. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Like I am, I'm a bit fair, but I have a sister who's a bit dark, darker than me. And you know, like yes. my father used to be a. a white man with blue eyes, green eyes, and then wow. you, you have an aunt who is dark. You know, like you could look at one family at different colors, different yeah. shades of colors. But that's fine. That's lovely. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. That whole criteria, that racist, racialist, you know, biological criteria for national identity is insane. It and, is. Uh, it is. It's it is insane. It really is. Uh, it's a capitalistic, well, yeah. imperialist category has no place in science or genealogy. Mm -hmm. It's just a, a political, economical a category to keep mm -hmm. people uh, uh, separated from each other in mm -hmm. order to control the masses. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. you go to, to you go to Cuba. There's no such thing called uh, African Cuban and Hispanic. Oh, Cuban. Yeah. They're all Cubans. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, like I I went to Cuba a couple of times, and you can't see, you can't feel the the separation between blacks and whites in in in, in Cuba. You know, they there are one coherent people. They don't look at each other as as black and white. They look at each other as Cubans. That's one of the the good thing that the revolution brought into Cuba. Right. You know, yes. Like I that I've. I've not I've met Cuban black U Cubans here, and I I spoke to them. He said, and I asked him about uh, racism. He said, I only realized I'm black when I came to this country. <laughs> That's right. When they came here, when yeah. they came here, he they said, I'm not, yeah. Too. When right. I was in Cuba, right, we never right. we never thought of us as blacks as right. only as Cubans. Mm -hmm. Exactly. They came okay. here. Okay, you're, you're talking about the working class, about the civil society, about the vast majority of the people, and it's all very true. Now, there's a nuance here, which is the class divide. The national bourgeoisie of Cuba was not black. It was Spanish purists, and they only married each other's families because they wanted to maintain their so-called racial purity of being Spanish colonializers. Yes, that's right. That's right. Now they're yeah. found in Miami, you know, like, a, yeah, you know, that's, you know, so that's, you know, the, that's the, the exception to the actuality that you're describing, which is rational, but the class divide is irrational because they use a racist category to create a class identity 
as a justification for their disparity of wealth and Absolutely. their exploitation of the others. Yes, Absolutely. it's a racist, you know, uh, presumption of capitalism that justifies capitalism in the mind of the bourgeoisie. That's true. You know, like I mean, uh, we go back to Soviet Union. No matter what you think of the Soviet Union, was of negative. They did not have that classification of. They have 158 different ethnicity, mm. and you have all kind of people running the the state, and they there's no one certain ethnicity controlling the the state. Mm. So um, that's one thing. Now, it's a different story. I think I, I don't think they still have that. They don't even have that any anymore. They don't have that in Russia. Even Russia today. The, the capitalist uh, state of Russia. They don't have that ethnicity classification like the way it is in the West. Mm -hmm. Also, the oh, bourgeoisie, oh. the national bourgeoisie in Russia has been hit hard by the sanctions. So they're weaker right. than they are before. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the state is becoming more predominant. The mm -hmm. war production industries are controlled by the state and is the principal economy of, the, of Russia, of the Russian Federation, so-called, but it's actually a confederation. But... Uh, Interesting, interesting prospects, you know, for uh, for Russia. Oh, I love it when I see sometimes, you know, the Russian military in Ukraine, you know, advancing. They put a flag, you know, on top of a building to show that they've succeeded in taking that particular city or village. And sometimes they put up two flags: one, the Russian Federation flag, and the other, the communist flag. The there's, a, there's there's a meaning behind that. It's the victory flag. They are they are saying, I, I I've been watching Russia today in English and Arabic. And one field commander was asked, why you host the Russian flag? He said, this is to symbolize the... To symbolize. Symbolize, symbolize, sorry, symbolize the uh, defeat of Nazism. Because right. so we right. are fighting Nazis in, in Ukraine. And we are, we, are, we are doing this again in less than 100 years, defeating Nazism. So we have to bring the the Soviet Union flag, which we flew over the Bundestag in right, Berlin. Exactly. So exactly. they do that. Yep. Mm -hmm. right. They're very Brilliant. proud of that. They're very, very proud of good. that. Very yeah, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So uh, I, uh, Abraham, I, I did do some back some research on the status of activism on the campuses. Oh, and good. I, I have a little report for you to share, OK? Yes. So um, um, many of our, lit, our, our viewers May have been wondering what's going on with the campus activism. Uh, why, why, why are we seeing encampments and this kind of thing? Well, there there has been some activism on the campuses. Um, let me see here. That's not it. I mean, you know, I had this problem. Hold on a second. Hold on. Hold on. Let me see sure. here. I'll I'll turn I'll turn the share off for a second. I'll turn it off for a second. I could hear you well. Well, no, but I, I have some images I want to show. I have some, I have oh, okay. Showing the images. So, basically, what's let me, let me show you what, what's happened. What's been going on is this. I, I'll stop sharing. There is, and I'll, I need you to help me. There is a Jewish harvest celebration. What's it called? It hmm. happens in the end of the fall. And uh, many of the many of the Jew, um, Jews for peace had oh, a Sukkot campuses. Sukkot, and yes. when you're supposed to go right. out to live in a in a tent in right. a hut, yeah, right. just like so, the Palestinians are living in now in Gaza. Right. So they the many across the country they had this this they attempted to have this celebration on the college campuses. Ah. Uh, the huts were not allowed. Uh -huh. uh, knowing that they could not construct anything in any campus in UCLA, the the building the huts were torn down. They constructed them and they were torn down. Uh -huh. It wasn't in the news, but uh -huh. I, I did see that across the country this 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 did occur. Uh -huh. um, on October seventh and October fifth, there were demonstrations around campuses and, and on campuses, but there been no there been no encampments allowed to be built. Um, at let me see. At at the at the University of Colorado, there was some spray painting of pro Palestinian uh, um, slogans on campus last week. Uh, also, um, and there's at the in schools in 
and Minnesota, they're still struggling over the issue of the best the divestment with with the, with the college with the college directors with the board of regents those kind of things. So it seemed to be a combination of on campus non encampment activities, um, still having to go discussions about not about divestment, and also the college administrations are fighting back, continue to claim that pro Palestinian. Uh, activism is anti-Semitic. That seems to be the, the, the dynamic right now. I, I, I talked to people personally on the phone and in person Thursday and Friday, did some research last night to make sure I could make this presentation on the program today. So people who are not, maybe not in the United States or, um, or in the United States, who are wondering why there have been the marches and the encampments there has been repression against the students, threats of suspensions, expulsions, fines, and that will take that will take a toll on a movement like this. It will, um, because they they have, they have certain rules that to follow when they're going to school, and the, the activism seems to be within certain bounds now. And that's that's in in general, the um, the Harvest Festival. Um, um, celebration did occur on many campuses, but uh, uh, universally, the students were students were not allowed to sleep inside. They were to sleep inside the huts. So that, that's all, you know. That's it for me. Wow, that's so uh, ironic in a bad way, you know, because the sukkahs, you know, like is a is a tent, just like the tents that are been set up in the tent cities, you know, in Gaza right now. Right. Right. So that should well, be understandable, you know, you know to uh, to Jewish people. It should sort of, you know, have an effect upon Jewish people. That's why they tore it down because it's too much of a parallel for them to tolerate. That's that. If if there's anything, if any meaning out of what's happening now in in campuses and uh, the hard hand or heavy hand by the states or the universities or even the federal government shows how scared they are. From yes. From the people, from the students, and how uh, you know uh, how um, how defeated they are when it comes to the narrative. They have no narrative to to defend what they're doing. Uh, they, they, in order to defend themselves, they go on the offense by using and enacting Nazi-like you know rules and regulations against students. Mm -hmm. That means we are winning. Right, mm -hmm. definitely. Right. I, I heard I heard a comment. Uh, a brother from, I think I think I think he was from somewhere in in the Levant, and he was speaking in England on on a program. And he, I got from him the understanding that um, not only the enemy, but the Palestinian people see the student movement as part of the axis. Of resistance, and I was, I was very encouraged to hear that. Yeah, mm -hmm. very interesting. Yeah, especially in England with the Palestine Action Movement there, which is right, right. taking yeah. on all the war production facilities, which should be done everywhere, but it's not. Okay, it should be done here yeah. in Montreal against well, General Dynamics. I, I think. I think. Uh, I do believe. I, I don't know. Like my my hunch, let's say, I don't have any information or facts, but I think the. After the this uh, election uh, right. finished and done, I think the 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 anti-war movement will, uh, you know, restart again mm -hmm. uh, in the United States, because most of the energy and work and it's all you know uh, toward the election. Mm -hmm. So when they say by by Tuesday night everything will be off, then the anti-war movement will uh, regenerate itself. That's mm -hmm. my take. I don't know. I, yes, I hope I think you're right. Yeah, yeah. Have you heard about the publisher of Haaretz magazine? Did you hear about the publisher of Haaretz? Yes, he yes. Out, he came out with a speech that was, you know, uh, basically, you know, subversive. You know, I mean, like if the government they, could, they would put him into prison for sure. They are sure enacting, a, they are, now they are the Zionist, uh, the new Nazis, and, and the not the the Zionist state are enacting two uh, laws. Number one law in reaction to the Haaretz uh, journalist 
that anybody who calls for sanctions against Israel should be jailed up to 10 years. That's one <laughs> law. Oh, yeah. Okay. And another law, another law to disallow the Palestinian Israeli citizens within so called Israel, disallowing them to uh, be part of the election. They, they should no, no vote, no representation. Wow. Yes. So, uh, yeah, they, I think they will do it. It's, it's moving slowly, slowly but surely to be a true uh, fascistic state. Uh, it's, it's 21st century, I call it the 21st century Nazi state. Because yeah. it's the, the tools and the means that the Nazi used to do, it's, it's way yeah. outdated to what the Zionists are doing now in Palestine and in Lebanon. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Even the Nazis had to take between 1933 and 1939 to fully develop, you know, their control over the society as yep. a Nazi dictatorial state. It yep. takes time, you know, to build up, you know, a fascist regime like that. And yep. that gives us some time in order to defeat it as well. It's yep. quite an historic contest that we have here. It is. I, I think it. the more the, the pressure the the people and the peoples around the world are putting for justice and freedom in Palestine, mm. the more the Zionists hasten their demise. Mm. Because what they're doing is instead of agreeing and accepting you know, justice and freedom, they're fighting it back with all their mights by enacting new laws, murdering mm. people, starving mm. them. And that's what happened to the Nazis. They're mm. gone. They're no more. Yeah. So I think the mm. same thing as for the apartheid South Africa. Yeah, it's gone. Yeah. There's no more. Uh -huh. hmm. So the Zion state is gonna go. It's coming. It's. I could see it. It's coming at the end. I don't know when, but I think within our lifetime, uh -huh. very shortly in the next few years. You know, Europe even is trying is starting to flip. You know, uh, against uh, the Zion state, France, uh, even Macron made some sort of a statement. You know that they're not going to be selling arms to the Zionists anymore. And the leading uh, political party there, you know, would recognize Palestine right away if they were allowed to form the government. You know, so things are happening there. So I can expect in the coming year that the Zionist state, if it continues as such, you know, will be, you know, suspended or expelled from the United Nations General Assembly. Palestine will be recognized as a state and then there can be further progress made until the General Assembly finally will overrule the Security Council and send peacekeeping troops and use coercion and force against the uh, occupation of the Zionists in Gaza and, and the West Bank too, and in Lebanon, and in uh, Syria, in the Golan Heights. You know, these are all sites, you know, should be taken on by the United Nations with peacekeeping troops, tens of thousands of peacekeeping troops. Then, But who would, contribute, who would contribute to such, you know, uh, troops? Well, it's the United States who's leading the war in Lebanon, in uh, Lebanon yes. and Palestine. It's but, not you know, with international public opinion, you know, a lot of states will line up, you know, to share in the glory of saving Palestine, finally, you know. Well, after I mean, I, I hope, I hope, so far, who is fighting, actually, in, in a strategic uh, point of view, is the United States. It's not just the Zionist state. Hmm. It's the United States, it's Britain, it's Germany yeah. are fighting. Actually, According to news, uh, the Zionists yesterday went and abducted a, a Lebanese uh, sailor from his home from northern Lebanon. So the story says that it was in, in a collaboration uh, with um, a German Navy that's supposed to be part of the UNIFIL in, uh, across from that place. So they came from that, uh, from that uh, ship. So basically, you are... The, the Palestinian Lebanese resistance are in fight against the NATO. As for Macron, Macron is actually, he is being embarrassed by what the Zionists are doing. They're embarrassing him. So he has to do something. He has to say something because, you know, you have at least one third of his National Assembly are on the left. And they say, you know, they're calling him out yeah. for you got to do something. So he has to do yeah. something. Yeah. So it's, it, we're not talking about England or Germany or United States or Canada or Australia. We're talking about France. France has different uh, dynamics when it comes to politics, especially in Palestine and Lebanon. So he has to come up with something. But 
deep inside. He is as Zionist as yeah. uh, Starmer and as Biden, Harris, yeah. and Biden Trudeau. Zionist. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, he is a Zionist. He's not gonna. He just been embarrassed and he has to something to say something, yeah. but he's not gonna do anything. Well, looking forward to next weekend, your report on the elections that is coming up this week. Yeah. And uh, yeah. something's going to happen. Oh, yeah. I, I think there's one more thing I'd like to throw in the, in the discussion today is Iran's uh, promise to uh, hit oh, yeah. back, retaliate yeah. to the Zionist aggression yes. on its uh, territories yeah. last week. Yeah. Oh. And uh, the Iranians uh, actually they are uh, they are making big threats and uh, promises that they will hit hard, very hard, harder than the one before against the Zionists. So I think there's something brewing in the next uh, few days mm-hmm. uh, in the retali- retali- retaliation to the Zionist aggression mm-hmm. against Iran. Mm-hmm. So yeah. it's uh, it's uh, things are getting. Uh, Heat up more and more because uh, the the mirage and facade of negotiation mm-hmm. and peace settlement uh, between the Palestinians and Lebanese from one side and the Zionists from the other side had fallen through. From, yeah, and I think there's uh, the um, you know there's only the field, the, the you know the ground field, uh, the battlefield. Sorry, the battlefield is the answer. That's the Zionist one way they want to do that. So let's mm. see them pray. We'll see what happened. Yeah. Well, um, we know we one thing that we know from last week, um, the, the research I did, uh, just listen to people, is very clear that the Israeli attack, the Israeli attempt to attack Iran was a failure. They may have they did kill some some Iranian soldiers and some Iranian soldiers. They did damage some buildings. But the word that's out now is that the the Israel did not the Israel and the United States did not expect the Iranian anti defense the the missile defense system to be as robust as it was. A large true. number of the missiles were shot down. They did not expect that. Mm-hmm. Also, when the stealth bombers were on the way, which were being refueled by the United States, they were being refueled by the United yeah. States. Yeah. Um, they were being tracked by Israeli radar. By you mean Iranian radars? Right. Yeah, Iran- Iranian radar, and they were scared. They turned around. Yeah. So they knew they were going to get shot down. And the, <laughs> the sight of uh, Israeli jets being shot down by an Iranian missile. That would have been it. Yeah. That's it. It's and over. It's oh, over. Australia. That would have been a strategic propaganda victory. Israel could never, could never have downplayed. It's a defeat to the United the States itself. Right. With this pride, or the the pride of its air force, the F thirty five. If F-35. one of them got shut down, uh, goodbye F thirty five. You know, big money makers to the. Right. To the United States, uh, you know, open manufacturers. Goodbye. <laughs> yeah. and also, also, Israel's had so little to say about this, this military incursion. They've said they've been very, they've been peep. And usually, when it goes their way, they're bragging. They got video. We did this. We got this. We did this, and we're coming back for more. So clearly, something definitely went wrong. Yep. That with that attack, they didn't get what they wanted. And now Iran has the upper hand, and we're going to see what happens. They definitely have to have the upper hand, and the and the U.S. and Israel have to be scared yeah. because they 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 were embarrassed in the previous attack. They were because the, the muscles got through the Iron Dome. They got through, and now they don't know what's going to happen. So what 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 we'll, we'll, uh, we'll see. We'll see. Yeah. What yeah. proves your point? Which make it really uh, uh, realistic and uh, right on is if the Zionists were successful, as they said, the Iranian, uh, they're successful and they manage to hit wherever they want. The Iranians will lay low and say nothing happened and did it slide. They will not say we gotta retaliate. But 
What happened, the Iranians in the same day said nothing happened, very little uh, minimal damage happened. Four soldiers lost their lives on one uh, civilians. Then they start saying we got to hit and we got to hit hard back on this aggression. Basically, the emboldening of what they have, as you said, as you mentioned, Steve, they are we're strong enough and we could de deter the Zionists and we could foil their attacks on us. So uh, it's a uh, way to be seen uh, in the next few days. Uh, yeah. the, the Iranians said that it's coming very soon. I think the most strategic target uh, for Iran to consider is that um, military airport called Mizrim or something that ha holds the uh, F-35s. That's where they take off, you know, to go and bomb Gaza and Lebanon. Yeah, it's called Nevatim. Ah, yes, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, but that's not just only. They have six air, uh, uh, airports uh, there. Oh. The, the... Oh, with F-35s? No, 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 no. No, F-35s, I think they are on two airports but i think i think i don't know uh my my take the iranians this time will target all these airports and take them out of the uh, service oh, that would we'll be see. strategic you know defeat for the zionist state because the only you know the only sort of level at which they have an upper hand is you know in control of the air air force that's it, that's it. if 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 hezbollah and the resistance can ever take down some airplanes. Mm -hmm. OMG, it's another day. Mm -hmm. That's that's their main their main element of surprise is, is satellite or satellite data mm -hmm. which the CIA gives them and mm -hmm. and the airplanes. That's it. That's yeah. true. Okay. Okay. Very good. Thanking you both for your interventions, and uh, we will meet again next week. Okay. Bye for now.